Roman studies at Carlton University in Ottawa for 50 years. After completing his honours BA at Bristol University in the UK, he emigrated to Canada to do graduate work at McMaster University and the University of Toronto. For 14 years, he directed dramatic readings of Greek tragedy for students in the College of Humanities at Carlton. These were highly praised. His main published work is centred on Aeschylus and Sophocles. His book, Sophocles and the Tragedy of Athenian Democracy was published in 2004. His lecture this evening is entitled The Athenian Plague and Eros as a Killer Virus in Euripides Hippolytus. And Josh told me that he relishes the thought of trying to say something controversial about Euripides. So, go for it. <laughs> Good evening, thank you very much for coming. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, you, Jonathan, for your kind words. And I'd like also to thank especially three other people. Uh, Dr. Helen Trifonis of the Canadian Institute in Greece, who left Ottawa recently and is here tonight but she's on her way to Sweden at some point. But thank you so much, uh, you did so well. I'd also like to thank uh, His Excellency Eleftherios Angelopoulos, the former Greek ambassador to Canada, uh, who regularly came to uh, many of the play readings that I directed. And finally, to Kathy Andriadis, uh, my partner for almost 20 years, who covers up more of my deficiencies than I care to mention. In 1960, uh, as an 18 year old high school student, I tried with two friends to hitchhike from northern France to Greece. I had fallen in love with the ancient Greek language. Alas, we never let that met reach the land of our dreams. I had to wait until 1966 before I finally came here. I've had many loves in my life, but few can compare with my love of Greece. I hope this lecture about the power of Eros expresses something of my love. Uh, my paper runs to about 55 minutes. Uh, to make it read smoothly, I have not given line references, which can be provided if necessary. And I ask your forgiveness if I pronounce Greek names the way that may not be familiar to all of you. Okay. In the early summer of 430 BCE, a devastating plague broke out at Athens, and in its first phase lasted until 429. It has been suggested that it ultimately killed as many as a third of the Athenians. In the following year, Euripides produced his tragedy Hippolytus, which won the first prize in the tragic competition at the city Dionysia. It was the second version of the myth he had produced. First had been a failure. The most common term used for the plague in Thucydides, by far our most important source, is nosos disease and its cognates, used on ten occasions. Though he employs the stronger term at Loimos, Pestilence three times. In Hippolytus, the word nosos and related terms are used 24 times, an unprecedented number, before Sophocles' Philoctetes of 409. In Hippolytus, it is the most frequently found thematic word. 
The cause of the plague is still debated. In this paper, without being clinically precise, I shall treat Eros metaphorically as a virus, which Aphrodite causes by making Phaedra fall in love with her stepson Hippolytus, whom the goddess wishes to kill for spurning her divinity. Love becomes a form of madness that afflicts all the human characters, main human characters. Although the characters, apart from Phaedra, do not experience her love sickness, nevertheless their minds all become deranged as the effects of her madness spreads. When the plague struck, the Athenians found neither doctors nor the performance of religious rites were of any help. Thucydides himself does not speculate about the cause of the plague, but simply describes its symptoms. Given his statement, however, in Book One, that in writing his history, he will avoid what he calls the fabulous or the mythical, we must assume he believed in a natural cause. This would be in keeping with the attitude of the author of the Hippocratic Treatise on the Sacred Disease, who wrote, Epilepsy appears to me to be no more divine or sacred than other diseases, but has natural causes. While ignoring a divine explanation, Thucydides, nevertheless, in another passage, does allow for those who believed in a divine origin of the plague. He makes Pericles, the Athenian statesman, who himself later died from the disease, tell the Athenians after it broke out, we must endure with resignation what the gods cause, ta daimonia. Since the origin was shrouded in mystery, the historian tells us that doctors and laymen alike were free to speculate on its causes. This statement allows for the Athenians being divided about its cause, some believing in a divine origin and others looking for a natural explanation. This division between those who believe that the plague was heaven sent and those who thought it could be explained from natural causes finds an analogue in the chorus's entrance song of Hippolytus. The Troitzanian women speculate on what has caused Phaedra to waste away on her sick bed for three days without taking food. On the one hand, they wonder whether the queen has been possessed by a god or whether she has committed a defence against Tictina, a goddess of wildlife in Crete, where Phaedra was born. On the other, they speculate on possible human causes. That her husband Theseus has been drawn into an adulterous relationship. That Phaedra has received troubling news from Crete. Or that she is physically and mentally suffering from labour pain. As Jacques Joanna writes, quote, the chorus of the Hippolytus envisages to explain Phaedra's disease two causes that are similar to the rational spirit of Hippocratic medicine. Indeed, after the hypothesis of a divine cause, the chorus envisages a cause of psychological or physical origin. The cause could be explained by Phaedra's distress or by the constitution of women. These are two rational explanations and correspond to Hippocratic medicine. End of quotes. A crucial problem is how to interpret the goddess Aphrodite and her son Eros. Just as the chorus speculate on a divine or natural cause for future disease, the gods can be understood in two separate ways. One, as interfering anthropomorphic deities, Two, as natural forces imminent in the world. In presenting them thus, Euripides mirrors the divisions among the Athenians in their attitude to the plague and its origins, supernatural and the natural. Mary Lefkowitz has argued that Euripides presents the Olympians as in the epic tradition of Homer. In the case of Aphrodite, she suggests, instead of the Iliad, Providing a direct model, Euripides seems more interested by, quote, the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, which depicts the goddess as powerful, deceitful, cunning, and indifferent to human suffering. 
While this may seem true of the way in which the goddess behaves in the prologue of Hippolytus, there is plenty of evidence in the play itself that Aphrodite was conceived as a natural force in the life of the world. In Hippolytus, for example, the nurse says, Picris haunts the sky, dwells in the surge of the sea, and all creatures are born from her. She is the one who sows and gives desire, Eros, from which we, Earth's offspring, have life. George Groover once pointed out that the common Greek word for a god, Theos, can be the personification of any more than human power in nature or any force in the heart of man which is also greater than the individual because it is shared by all individuals. This personification of abstract concepts as theoi is neatly illustrated in the historian Herodotus. When the statesman Themistocles tries to extort money from the Andrians by saying that the Athenians are escorted by two powerful theoi, persuasion and compulsion. To this, the Andrians replied that the Athenians were indeed blessed to have such powerful gods, but they were too useless theoi on their island who wouldn't leave poverty and helplessness, who can't give what they don't have. Euripides provides many examples of abstractions as they are. Ambition, quality, shame, strife, grief, hope, and even tyranny. As a son of Aphrodite, Eros cannot automatically be placed in the category of a theos as a personified abstract force. In the first choral ode devoted to the power of Eros, the god is described as the tyrant of mankind the key holder of Aphrodite's most intimate bedchambers. In most contexts, however, Eros, conceived simply as passion or desire, is used as a force in human nature, not as an anthropomorphic deity. As Phaedra says, when the passion, Eros, struck me, I considered how best I might bear it. From there, then, I first kept silence and tried to conceal the disease. Thus, like the Athenians' reactions to the play, the audience can either view Phaedra's nosos as resulting from an interfering anthropomorphic deity or as one of life's natural dangers. In his anthropological study, Geoffrey Lloyd says the Greeks classified diseases as follows. Divine things, lack of education, love, senselessness, the Greek being anoia, an unbridled tongue, madness, and disorder. With the exception of disorder, all these become applicable in some way to the dramatic action. Only Phaedra displays the full-blown symptoms of the badness of Eros. But when the nurse, as the first, giver, first caregiver, contracts the disease from Phaedra, and passes it on to Hippolytus and hence to Theseus, the disease morphs. They display a form of madness, or at least senselessness, and an unbridled tongue. Hippolytus also shows a total lack of education about Aphrodite's power. Eros, as a disease, first affects the individual through the eyes. As Padel writes, vision is a two-way channel between the inner and outer world. It particularly attacks the frenes, as we know from Homer onwards, in, for example, Hera's seduction of Zeus. The Greeks conceived of frenes as central to both thoughts and um, emotions. Although Eros may at first seem gentle, it is a form of madness that distorts both thinking and feeling. The chorus of Sophocles' Antigone well describes Eros' iris irresistible power. The passage alludes to the quarrel between Creon and his son Hymon, but it could just as well describe the violent exchange between Theseus and his son in Hippolytus. Love invincible in battle, love who falls upon men's property, you who spend the night upon the soft cheeks of a girl, 
and travel over the sea and through the huts of dwellers in the wild. None among the immortals can escape you, nor any among mortal men. And he who has you is mad. You wrench just men's minds, frenes, aside from justice, doing them violence. It is you who have stirred up this quarrel between men of the same blood. Victory goes to the visible desire that comes from the eyes of the beautiful a bride. Desire that has its throne besides those of the mighty laws. For irresistible in her sporting is the goddess Aphrodite. Hygeia, health, is the opposite of Nosos. But for metrical reasons, it is rarely found in tragedy. And the one occasion it occurs in Hippolytus will be mentioned below. In Hippolytus, since Phaedra's illness takes the form of a madness, a more common antonym to Nosos is Sophrosyne and its cognates, which are found 18 times, more than in any other extant Euripidean tragedy. If we see the action of the tragedy in moral terms, so Frosnay's meaning becomes ambiguously complex and is variously translated as temperance, moderation, virtue, and even chastity. Its etymological meaning, however, is safe-mindedness. If we consider Eros metaphorically as a virus that deranges the mind, then none of the human dramatis personae can be held morally responsible. Therefore, Thophrosyne is often much better understood as sane-mindedness or sanity. As a result, in the following dramatic analysis, I shall pay little attention to the culpability of the human characters as moral agents. In contrast, I shall put much emphasis on how Euripides creates the mise-en-scene in order to show how the infection is passed from one individual to another. The twofold structure of the play's prologue sets up a sharp division between the diseased realm of Aphrodite and the clean air of the countryside, the realm of Artemis. Let us look at this structure before considering the initial mise en scène. The opening words of Aphrodite establish says, the ubiquity of her power and fame among mortals and gods. In mentioning all mortals who dwell within the boundaries of the Black Sea and the Atlantic, she describes in conventional terms the limits of the world inhabited by Greeks. She will brook no slight to her godhead, but will trip up those who do not honour her. The verb stalo, to trip, forms a late motif connecting all the main characters, Phaedra, the nurse, Hippolytus and Theseus. Ironically, it will be used again in the prologue by Hippolytus, when after his attendant is about to warn him to pay homage to Aphrodite, he cautions him not to let his tongue slip up. More significantly, it is used later by the nurse in the form of an aphorism to Phaedra about Hygeia health. They say that unbending regimes cause more slips than pleasure and are more hostile to health. In turning to Hippolytus, Aphrodite informs us that he is the child of Theseus by an Amazon. The first of three references. Amazons were purely unsuited to a Greek conception of civilized life, and later Hippolytus's illegitimacy will be given focus. This hereditary helps, perhaps, to explain not only Hippolytus' own devotion to hunting and Artemis, but also his total rejection of sex and marriage, which so angers Aphrodite. After Aphrodite's harsh words of how Phaedra will be the instrument of her revenge, the emphasis falls on the process by which the virus Eros attacks its victim. The description has several naturalistic touches. Hippolytus visits Athens to attend the mysteries. There, Phaedra first sets eyes on him and is overcome by Eros. The strength of the virus's attack on Phaedra 
is shown by the repetition of the word eros five times in 13 lines. Though none of the household knows the nosos, which is destroying her. While in Athens, Hippolytus is protected from Phaedra's disease because they never actually meet. But as the play opens, Theseus and Phaedra have taken up residence in Troyes. As Aphrodite sees Hippolytus returning from the hunt, she withdraws. In the following section of the prologue, we are first transported imaginatively away from the cruel vindictiveness of Aphrodite, out of the polis to the idyllic countryside where Hippolytus has been consorting with the goddess Artemis. Hippolytus and his, ten and his attendants are just returning and take up a position near a statue of Artemis, away from the central door of the Skene. After the spoken iambics of Aphrodite, the sung lyrics of the huntsman, in the form of cult prayers to Artemis, ring in the changes of atmosphere. Hippolytus addresses Artemis as Urania, a term more usually used of Aphrodite at Athens, where there was a cult to her. This may suggest that in keeping with his birth by an Amazon, Hippolytus is unfamiliar with normal polis life. After the prayers, Hippolytus offers a garland at Artemis' statue. He brings this garland woven from a pure meadow, which, quotes reverence makes fertile with dewy rivulets for those to pluck, in whom nothing is taught, did act on, but sophrosyne, is naturally inherent in all matters for all time. End of quote. As Lloyd said earlier, the Greeks regarded lack of education as disease. Therefore, the audience may wonder about Hippolytus's sophrosyne. In fact, Hippolytus is in a liminal space between sanity and madness. And he is about to move from the pure air of Artemis's countryside into Aphrodite's diseased house. Three things are emblematic of this change. First, he dismisses his companions in the hunt. Secondly, in putting the garland woven from a virgin meadow on the statue of Artemis and walking away, he is severing his connection with the goddess, leaving himself without her protection. The very act of this change in his costume is a harbinger of a change in his fortunes. Hippolytus' third act is the most ominous of all, and this is given special prominence by the dialogue with his old attendant. When this retainer tries to teach him to pay his respects to Aphrodite, whose statue lies nearby, Hippolytus not only spurns the advice, but retorts, No God satisfies me who enthralls at night. Shortly thereafter, he will walk blindly into the dark interior of the house, where Phaedra, the vector of Aphrodite's deadly virus, lies stricken on her bed under the crippling effects of the disease. As Aphrodite had ominously declared earlier when she saw Hippolytus approaching the house, he does not know that the gates of death lie open, and this is the last daylight he sees. Given this mise-en-scene, the only meaningful staging is to have Aphrodite deliver her prologue speech from the roof of the Skene, since in Hippolytus, the house and its immediate environs is the universe over which her virulent power holds sway. The entrance song of the chorus increases the suspense for the delayed entrance of Phaedra. It is now the third day that Phaedra has taken to a diseased bed without food. She keeps her fair hair covered as her body wastes away while she is dying from an undivulged illness. After speculating on the causes, the chorus make much of Phaedra's appearance as she enters. They notice how the queen is so changed in colour. Later, the chorus will explain to the nurse how weak and wasted Phaedra looks and wonders why Theseus does not see how ill she is by looking at her face. Also, 
it would seem that Fija has a ghost-like appearance with a distinctive mask, presumably visible even though she is wearing a headdress. The verbal stress on her appearance may well be to ensure that the whole audience, given the size of the theatre, are aware of the details if they are not visible to all. When Phaedra and the nurse finally enter, Phaedra is seen lying on her bed. One of the terms for bed had already been used by Aphrodite in the prologue to describe Hippolytus's rejection of sex. The sick bed on which the diseased Phaedra is lying will later morph into the beer on which her corpse is laid out. Let me here make a bold statement. The bed beer is not only the most dominating visual image of the tragedy, but it becomes, as it were, almost a character in its own right and takes on a life of its own. If my calculations are correct, the bed beer is on stage for more than two-fifths of the play, longer than that of any single dramatis persona. As Melissa Muller has written, objects in certain situations instigate acts independently of their maker users and thereby acquire a kind of animacy. In tragedy, beds can have multivalent meanings. The bed never indicates a restful sleep, though it can suggest a diseased and nightmarish one, as in Euripides' play Orestes. Where it indicates marriage, it is most commonly allied with death and or adulterous sex. In Sophocles' Trachinii, for example, Heracles has sent Ierly home to share Dianyra's bed on which his wife kills herself. Later, Heracles is carried home on a stretcher near death. Disease, marriage and death and false tales of, of adultery, all these are embedded in the text of Hippolytus. In Hippolytus, Phaedra has taken to her sickbed because she wants to die from her disease rather than reveal her adulterous feelings for Hippolytus. When Phaedra first appears on stage, her bed signifies that her disease is being exposed to the public and not confined to her chamber. In the entrance song of the chorus and first episode of the tragedy, although the verbal images are mainly of Phaedra's sickbed, the theme of adultery is never far removed from the bed imagery, as when the chorus wonder whether somebody is seducing Theseus into an adulterous relationship. The connection between imagined adultery and the marriage bed will become increasingly prominent as the plot progresses. It is part of the diseased atmosphere created by Eros. The first verbal exchange between Phaedra and the nurse takes the form of a lyric duet. This use of recitative helps to create an uneasy tension as the nurse becomes increasingly frustrated in trying to discover the hidden cause of Phaedra's disease. When Phaedra demands that her headdress be removed and her hair let loose, it seems that she will reveal her passion for Hippolytus as she goes into a fantasy about hunting in the woods and on the mountains. But Euripides teases the audience's expectations by dwelling instead on the effects the virus has on Phaedra's mind and then haunting them. Although she has become temporarily totally unhinged, suddenly Phaedra's flight of fantasy <coughs> passes and she demands that her head be covered again. Madness comes in fits and starts. As a result, the nurse has accomplished nothing, and the audience knows no more of how the plot will be worked out than they had learnt from Aphrodite in the prologue. All that has happened is that the audience has experienced the agony of a woman lying on a sick bed in the throes of a deadly disease. In view of the events of the previous two years of the plague at Athens, how would this spectacle have registered on the minds of the audience, many of whom would have witnessed almost too recently and too close for comfort the sick and dying on beds in their own homes? Being urged by the chorus to apply more pressure, 
to learn the cause of Fiji's illness and her mind's wanderings, the nurse resorts to the spoken word for a more pragmatic approach, in which she suggests that Fiji will betray her children and benefit the illegitimate Hippolytus if she dies. The sound of Hippolytus's name elicits a cry from Phaedra, which allows the nurse to press her suit further. From her response, we learn that a miasma has taken control of the queen's mind. Phaedra sees herself as ritually unclean, and so contact with her is dangerous. Although she has not done wrong physically, her mask and costume have already revealed the diseased state of her being. Careful attention must be given to the exceptional nature of the mise-en-scene in what follows, for Euripides makes special demands on his audience. In a final effort to draw the queen out about her illness, the nurse seizes Phaedra's hands and knees in an act of supplication and won't let go until Phaedra promises to grant her request. Normally, a suppliant would either cling to an altar of a god or grasp the hand and knees of someone with power of life and death over them to invoke their protection, as say a fallen warrior before his enemy, or like Priam in the Iliad asking Achilles for his son Hector's body to be returned for burial. The nurse is in neither situation, and if anything, it is Phaedra who needs protection. In grasping the hands and knees of a woman on a sickbed, the nurse perverts the act of supplication and in so doing makes contact with the diseased woman. Those who attend the sick, like the nurse, are the most likely to expose themselves to the contagion of the ill person, as Thucydides informs us. The effect on the nurse of learning of Phaedra's illness is immediate. She collapses both mentally and physically, almost as if she's going to die. The final words sum up the virulent power of Aphrodite. I will cast down my body, and by dying be rid of life. Farewell, I no longer exist. For those who are sane-minded, so far as unwillingly desire what is wrong, but do so nevertheless. Cypris is not simply a god, but something greater than a god who has destroyed this woman here and me and the house. To add to the confusion, the chorus immediately break out into Dokmiaks, a lyric meter expressing extreme emotion and their fear for the future for both Phaedra and the house. They too recognize the baleful influence of Aphrodite in whatever fate awaits the poor child from Crete. The nurse's actions present a staging some dramatic problem that cannot be ignored, but which has not been seriously addressed by scholars. Where is the nurse during the long speech of Phaedra that follows? And why is she where she is? To say simply that the nurse collapses is inadequate, since her last words implied that she has either died or fainted from shock. And if there is a collapsed body of a nameless <laughs> slave on stage, an unprecedented act in the Greek tragic corpus, we want to know what is happening. Lying on stage and moving without an explanation being given will mean that the nurse is likely to upstage Phaedra during her following monologue. To understand what is happening, we must begin with Phaedra. Earlier before divulging the cause of her illness, Phaedra had been bedridden. When the cause became known, a great burden is lifted from her shoulders, as is witnessed by the very reasoned speech she makes after the nurse has collapsed. In this speech, Phaedra gives a rational and moving account of the noble values by which she tried to govern her life, realizing how easy it is to fall short of them and how women especially become objects of hate. She curses the woman who first disgraced her marriage bed by committing adultery. When she succumbed to the wound Eros inflicted, Phaedra tried to hide it and to overcome her insanity and noia by sensible thinking, past so frozen But Aphrodite proved too strong, 
So she resolved to die and prefer, preserve her family's reputation rather than be shown a disloyal wife. It is almost as if, with a veil of secrecy lifted, Phaedra's virus has gone into remission. To make such a long rhetorical speech on a sickbed, leaving aside the physical demands on an actor in so large a theatre, would be strange, to say the least. So it is reasonable to assume that before making it, Phaedra has risen from her bed. When exactly she stands up, we cannot be sure. But it would make dramatic sense for her to rise after she has made the nurse let go of her hand and knees by promising to reveal the cause of her sickness. And then shortly thereafter, for the nurse to collapse on the bed. The nurse and Phaedra would thus change places. Since the bed has been contaminated with Eros's virus, the nurse's falling on the bed will be a further indication for the audience that she has succumbed to the baleful power of Aphrodite. Up until the disclosure of Phaedra's illness, the nurse's role has been conventional as far as those of nurses going Greek tragedy, mainly to act as a foil by providing important information and, when necessary, support. What happens next is one of the great surprises in tragedy. Long ago, Bernard Knox informed us that the nurse's role is longer than that of both Phaedra's and Theseus's, being second only to that of Hippolytus. What kind of nurse is this? In what follows, it is the nurse who becomes the active vector in transmitting the Eros virus to Hippolytus. Having, as it were, recovered from her fainting spell, the nurse begins her speech by claiming that her reaction to Phaedra's misfortune had been ignorant, and among human beings, second thoughts are somehow sophoto The meaning of these words has been much discussed, but they are best taken as a Euripidean marker to the audience that the nurse will be, a, will be different from the conventional tragic nurse she was before. Unbeknown to herself, this resurrected nurse has become Aphrodite's form. Whether wiser rather than cleverer, therefore, is a more appropriate <coughs> translation for the comparative adjective sophotorai may be doubted. For her arguments will be full of sophistic rhetoric, neatly alighting in her recognition of the power of Eros, that Phaedra's love is adulterous and some might think incestuous. <coughs> Phaedra had realised earlier that since she could not overcome Aphrodite, death was her only recourse. Now the nurse claims, irrationally, as will be shown later, that she has a pharmacon, a drug to cure her mistress's sickness. But this drug will prove to be a deadly poison, not a cure. The nurse's argument in this speech is not so much one of a caring mind her as one of a dangerous quack. As Cossack writes of the nurse, the remedy she proposes to resolve Phaedra's situation looks neither to 5th century medical procedures nor to traditional religious methods of prayer and sacrifice for its justification. Instead, the nurse's remedy belongs to the realm of magic. At 478, she mentions incantations and words of enchantment. At 509, she speaks of love potions and potions of enchantment, which require such clearly magical ingredients as hair from the beloved's head or some piece of his or her clothing. None of these remedies are ever suggested in the Hippocratic Corpus. Indeed, these are exactly the sort of treatments the rationalist healer is determined to condemn and avoid. End of quote. Aphrodite causes the nurse to lose contact with reality and she betrays a lack of sanity. Later, having returned to her senses after failing to win Hippolytus over to her immoral scheme, she will recognize this. My desires were ill-founded in searching for cures for your illness. If I had succeeded in truth, I would have been counted among the wise. 
I was not same minded. Ook es so fond of me. Peter tries to oppose the immoral, <coughs> sorry, tries to oppose the immoral proposal of the nurse, but she is debilitated by her sickness and her resistance lags. More reluctant than willing, she allows the nurse to try her love charms. Although realizing that her soul is yielding to Eros through the nurse's shameful persuasion. At the end of their dialogue, the nurse, with a prayer to Aphrodite, departs into the house. But does she enter the Skene alone? She is clearly going in to confront Hippolytus in some way, because she claimed for her drug to work, it is necessary to get a token from Hippolytus, a lock of hair or a piece of his clothing. During this exceptionally long first episode between Vidra and the nurse, the sick bed has been on stage. This is an appropriate time for it to be taken off and to serve as a further sign of the peril Hippolytus is in. When earlier he first entered the diseased house, Vidra was on her sick bed. Now that he is in the house, the nurse, the new vector of the disease, and the sick bed are, as it were, tracking him down. The first choral ode marks a critical turning point in the tragedy as a note of violence is struck before the dramatic action begins to focus on Hippolytus. In the ode, the turbulence Aphrodite and Eros calls are captured by images drawn from war and pillage. Deceptively, Eros, under the appearance of pleasure, makes war against his victims. The bolts of Aphrodite Eros shoots are stronger than fire and even the stars. Humans are deranged in worshipping at Olympia and Delphi without acknowledging Eros, the tyrant lord of human beings, who holds the keys to Aphrodite's bedrooms and who wreaks havoc among lives. <coughs> As evidence of this, the chorus alludes to the violence of Heracles in his destructive rape of the virgin and unmarried Ierly, or the lightning-struck marriage of Semeline to Zeus. Following the ode, Phaedra, eavesdropping at the Skene door, tells the chorus of the disastrous events inside as the nurse fails in her attempt to persuade Hippolytus to reciprocate Phaedra's feelings. He denounces her as a procuress and a betrayer of her master's marriage bed. This is the first time the term lekos has been used of the bed since the chorus's entrance song, when the chorus in a double image of words for bed <laughs> coined together with lekos, wonder whether some woman has seduced Theseus. Coite has been the main term to describe Phaedra's sick bed. Now that the sick bed has left the stage, the, um, the emphasis falls more on the marriage bed. Phaedra's eavesdropping at the Skene door is also an exceptional scene, but critics have signally failed to suggest why Euripides has adopted such a remarkable piece of stagecraft. We saw in the prologue how Aphrodite commanded the Skene and Hippolytus passed from the purity of the open meadows into the infected house. With the nurse accosting him in the house, he is within the grasp of her diseased presence. To ensure that the audience do not misunderstand the significance of what happens within, the dialogue continues outside as Phaedra retreats from the door and the nurse enters pursuing Hippolytus as he claims that he cannot keep silent before he is heard. While he tries to flee the nurse's contagious presence, she grasps at his hands and then clasps his knees in supplication. Successful earlier with her corrupt attempt at supplication with Phaedra, she now fails, fails, sorry, to win over Hippolytus. In both cases, however, Aphrodite's deadly work has been done, or by contact with the nurse, however fleeting, Hippolytus is contaminated with the Eros virus that derages his mind. We learn from Euripides' Orestes that an uncontrollable tongue is a disease. Violent denunciations of women are certainly not foreign to Greek literature, and Euripides was satirized by comic poets for misogyny. 
Hippolyta's reply to the nurse in rejecting her plea for secrecy became notorious. My tongue swore, my mind is unsworn. The tirade Hippolytus now launches against women, however, in its abusive vitriol, is so over the top as to be almost comic. Clearly the comic poets found line 612 funny and shows all the indications of someone who has lost his marbles. Or perhaps I should say sanity. We cannot preclude the notion that Rivers was being intentionally funny to prove if proof were needed that in his rejection of Aphrodite, Hippolytus' mind has made him completely irrational. Moreover, in asserting that Zeus should have found another means for the procreation of the human race rather than women, his speech becomes not simply his own rejection of Eros, but a bitter denunciation of everything Aphrodite stands for. That his contact with the nurse has caused this defamatory speech is clear by his own words to her. As you too, your abomination, came to traffic in my father's in Violable marriage bed. I shall cleanse such defilements by splashing my ears with flowing streams of water. In all Greek literature, as Gregory says, it is only Hippolytus who not only preaches but practices a wholesale rejection of the female sex. The denouement of his vitriol will be precisely what Aphrodite intends the death of both. Phaedra and himself, so eloquently expressed by Phaedra's anger and departing words to the nurse as she leaves to kill herself. Aphrodite is destroying me, and it is she whom I shall delight on this day by being good of life. I shall be overcome by grievous eros, but by my death I will prove a bane to another so that he may learn not to be disdainful of my malady, but sharing in this illness nosos with me, he will learn how to be same-minded. So broadening. These words will prove prophetic, almost as if Euripides <coughs> designed them to be Phaedra's swan song. For Hippolytus will learn what sanity is, when, then, when having recovered from his own fit of madness, he has to face Theseus' deranged attack on himself. We should notice that, as Hippolytus had shown no signs before of being in love, his nosos in line 730 has to be understood here as a general sign of madness that Phaedra's love sickness is caused. If we are not mistakenly preoccupied with Phaedra's culpability at this point, we read this passage as another marker of how Aphrodite's virus spreads among her victims. Such is the unbearable tension in this passage as Phaedra prepares for her suicide. But in the following ode, the chorus fantasizes, albeit briefly, about escaping beyond the seas. They then trace the fateful passage of Phaedra from Crete to Athens to magnetic Greece, causing the dire workings of Aphrodite on her which lead to her suicide. Therefore her heart was shattered by the terrible disease, Nosos, of unholy passions, erotes of Aphrodite. Cries are heard from within the Scene as the hanging body of Phaedra is discovered, which alarms the homecoming Theseus. A voice calls for the queen to be cut down and her body laid out as for burial. During this scene, many things happen to alert the audience's attention. Theseus' arrival is the first entry from the countryside since Hippolytus in the prologue. As a consultant at an oracle, Theseus is wearing a garland, as was his son earlier. On hearing of Phaedra's death, the king casts it off. But Theseus, too, cuts his ties with the ritual purity required of one consulting a god's oracle. As in the case of Hippolytus uh, leaving the garland on Artemis' statue, Theseus' act foreshadows that his life will be irreparably changed. The house over which Aphrodite has taken control <coughs> admits of no happy homecoming or rejoicing. When Theseus calls for the doors to be opened, the echo claimer is rolled out from inside. 
the skene revealing Vidra's body. The skene now takes on the look of the house of death. <clears throat> As earlier described by Aphrodite and later also by Hippolytus. What is equally significant is that Vidra's body is lying on a bier. In the first episode, in the presence of two females, Phaedra and the nurse, the bed was emblematic of Phaedra's illness, stemming from a desire for an adulterous union. In the second episode of comparable length, in the presence of two males, Theseus and Hippolytus, the bed is transformed into a beer, emblematic of the union of marriage and death. More importantly, what unites the two episodes are the faults and the innuendos of adultery brought about by Aphrodite. As the goddess of sexual love, her power in the form of a disease can destroy marriages and drive sane people insane. When Theseus finds and takes the tablet from his wife's hands in which he accuses Hippolytus of trying to rape her, the king makes direct contact with Phaedra's polluted <coughs> corpse through the deadly virus of Phaedra of, of Aphrodite's deceptive ingenuity. It is often assumed that what Phaedra writes is a suicide note designed to avenge herself on Hippolytus for spurning her unrequited love and to protect her reputation. Melissa Muller, however, argues that the tablet functions in a manner similar to a legal curse tablet often used in law courts to silence an opponent and here designed to silence Hippolytus and to teach him so Sophrosyne. It reflects a tension between the noble Phaedra concerned about her reputation and the woman whose mind has been diseased by Aphrodite. While there is truth in this, it is only a partial truth, <coughs> since it overlooks another purpose of the tablet, which consists in the effect it has on its physical recipient. After reading what is written, Theseus loses any sense of sane-mindedness, so Frosine, and behaves totally rationally by cursing his son and banishing him without a hearing. Through the ensuing episode, the bed beer and the body as well as the tablets, serve as a visual enactment on stage of the malevolent power of Aphrodite. In Hippolytus, madness is not a constant condition, but comes and goes in fits and starts. There is nothing abnormal about this, and those who suffer from psychologically abnormal behaviour, there is usually a physical or mental trigger to cause them to become mentally deranged. After Aphrodite has caused Phaedra to be stuck out of her wits, everything related to her becomes contagious. Thus, after the nurse has touched Phaedra in supplication and learns of her illness, she shows all the signs of a mental breakdown before collapsing onto Phaedra's sickbed. When she comes to, the speech she makes is full of suggestions for irrational magical cures. Unlike the honest nurse earlier, nurse earlier, this new nurse speaks with a lying tongue, having learned the deceptive arts of Patho. Later, after her approach to Hippolytus on behalf of her lovesick mistress has failed, she recovers her, sorry, her sanity sufficiently to recognize her mistake, but not before she has ensured the death of Peter and in so doing has destroyed her own raison d'etre as a nurse, whether she actually lives or dies. Hippolytus shows the symptoms of madness when he fails to escape the contagious supplication of the nurse and makes a speech not only in denunciation of women as a sex, but of Aphrodite herself. Later, he recovers his reason in defending himself against the false accusations of Theseus and shows his nobility in not divulging the promise he made to the nurse. But the damage has already been done through the insidious virus Aphrodite has implanted into Theseus' mind by means of the lying tablet he takes from Phaedra. As Hippolytus asks Theseus with poignant accuracy, has some relative poured slander about me into your ears, 
And do we fall sick, not <clears> through men, <throat> through no fault of our own? I am dumbfounded for your words, unhinged from reason, friend own, astound me. Throughout this scene, Theseus is holding the lying tablet, and there are five references to the marriage bed. Before Hippolytus leaves to go into exile, Theseus's annoia is unabating. There is little that can be added to our understanding about the virulent effect of Aphrodite before the appearance of Artemis. <coughs> Theseus's invocation of Poseidon to bring about his curse on Hippolytus is fulfilled unerringly, as we learn from the messenger's speech. Attendants will carry his dying body back to Troyton. In the short final astrophic ode in which the turbulent dock neck meter predominates as the tragedy reaches its climate, there is a final hymn to the power of Aphrodite and Eros. But there is no condemnation of the goddess, simply a recognition of the universal power of Aphrodite over gods and men alike. Its purpose is to stress that, like her or not, she is an amoral force. And that if her power should prove virulent, her wayward offspring, Eros, can strike down all and sundry without regard to status or moral, moral character, much though the human dramatis persona themselves may be preoccupied with such matters, and I would add many more. The last note turns the audience's attention away from the dying Hippolytus to Aphrodite. Then the arrival of Artemis on top of the Skene as a deus ex machina comes as all the more of a surprise. Although such is the law that prevails among the gods that they do not interfere with the actions of other deities and so she cannot save Hippolytus from dying, nevertheless Artemis as a virgin god and one represented the pure air of the countryside appearing on the roof of the house signifies to the audience that the plague caused by Aphrodite is finally over. Life can return to normal, at least temporarily, until Artemis decides when to have her revenge by attacking one of Aphrodite's favorites. Artemis is no more forgiving than her enemy. But we should not simply judge her, since Euripidean gods, as I have said, can also be regarded as amoral powers. In this pitiless world, the gods are like high-tension electric wires. You touch them, and you get fried. It is left to Hippolytus and Theseus to find whatever human comfort there can be. Gods in the form of plagues, causes it is indiscriminately both sickness and death. In his book, The Theatre and Its Double, the influential French theatre theorist Antonin Artaud denigrated the Western theatrical tradition for putting too heavy reliance on the spoken word. Instead, he would place a far greater emphasis on a theatre without much scenery, but in which the mise en scène is crucial. As he writes, Speech in the Western theatre is used only to express psychological conflicts particular to man and the daily reality of his life. But the domain of the theatre is not psychological, but plastic and physical. And it's not a question of whether the physical language of theatre is capable of achieving the same psychological resolutions as the language of words, whether it's able to express feelings and passions as well as words can, but whether there are not attitudes in the realm of thought and intelligence that words are incapable of grasping, and that gestures and everything partaking of a spatial language attain with more precision than words. Arto does not condemn the works of a Sophocles or a Shakespeare because they are too wordy. Rather, modern productions have overshadowed the original cultural context that made them true theatre. Theatre should not be seen as a work of art, but as an integral expression of a culture. In the above essay, I have tried to recapture some of the original mise-en-scene of the Hippolytus, in which the placement of the gods on the roof, the physical gestures of the nurse, the appearance of the bed beer, etc., 
had meaning beyond the scope of any noose of words. Arto spends a whole chapter comparing theatre to a play. The theatre, like the plague, is a crisis which is resolved by death or cure. And the plague is a superior disease because it is a total crisis after which nothing remains except death or an extreme purification. These ideas, I believe, come close to the theatre the Greek tragic poets created as illustrated by Euripides Hippolytus. This paper has been written partly in protest against trivializing the significance of Greek tragedy by those who would put characterization in the foreground of its, of its interpretation, rather than focusing on the turbulence of its world, in which we humans may seem to be, in the words of Sophocles, no more than phantoms or a dream of a shadow. Due to the Tunisian War. Yes. So, in that case, can we say that all these infections, deaths, uh, disasters symbolize the disaster that war brought to us? Well, I mean, undoubtedly, I mean, the, the he doesn't talk about war. No. <laughs> Nor does he, by the way, in Medea, which he wrote three years earlier, on the, at the outbreak of the war, okay? I mean, the war doesn't come in that. But we know from Thucydides uh, that what helped the spread of the plague was, of course, the Spartans invaded in the summer and all the people living out on the countryside, which is a very large number, a poor portion of the population, had to come in the cities and every inch was crowded and people were sleeping on the walls. So this crowded uh, situation must have uh, you know, caused the plague being much worse than it actually was. So that is in the background, but it's not explicitly drawn on in the plague. But I mean, uh, sorry, in the plague. But, um, you know, <coughs> clearly, um, uh, the Athenian audience would have been aware of uh, all this, and as would Euripides himself. You know, so it's, it's, it's there unsaid, but I think it's, uh, it's, it is part of the, the you know, of us, the, uh, the idea of a crisis that happens, which I think makes this play. I mean, I think it's an extraordinary play. Um, yes, and it's actually sort of an answer. I mean, there is no full answer to your question. Anybody else? Yes. Um, I'm wondering how common the characterization, conception of the interior space being the area of disorder and the exterior space being. The clean area. Yeah, I think that dichotomy is set up for this play particularly. So you can have the two polarities between Artemis, who is uh, you know, represents the countryside and hunting and all those activities, and Aphrodite. I mean, I suppose love does take place in the countryside, but it's something that you would more associate with her as a polis deity. And in Athens itself, uh, Aphrodite. Yeah, there was a cult of Aphrodite um, uh, called Urania, not one of Artemis, which means heavenly, okay, and that was important within Athens itself. Also, one of the things I think you should notice about this, so I don't have time to dwell on, that the idea of Patho, which means persuasion, uh, was a god herself closely associated with Aphrodite. Because patho in ancient Greek does not simply mean verbal persuasion, but if you see a beautiful body in front of you, that is a form of persuasion. So patho also has erotic associations. But on the other side as well, um, you know, patho was associated with the democracy, you see, because the power of persuasion is first. But I mean, Artemis is important. Uh, well, so see, it was a cult of her out in Brow on outside of, uh, of Athens, but I mean, I think this dichotomy, if I can, is specifically set up for him in the play, but by, um, particularly by the division of the prologue between Aphrodite's speech and then 
the huntsman returning and that, that part. By the way, if anybody doesn't know, the prologue means in Greek everything before the entrance of the main chorus. Okay. Any others? Don't be shy. I'm the only one who's shy here. Uh, yes, uh, that's uh, that's me. Yes, it's not really a question. It's just an expression of my appreciation. Uh, listening to a lecture by Professor Beer after 40 years. Uh, I was at Carlton, uh, and we spent so much time together. The only thing that comes to mind is, uh, yes, after seeing the theme of the lecture, I tried to work out some bibliography to make an intelligent uh, comment or question. I couldn't reach one fourth of uh, what you just mentioned. <laughs> yeah, all that comes to mind is that uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, through their lyric uh, songs, knew exactly uh, the force of errors. And, oh, absolutely. And, and it's Sappho. I mean, I didn't have time to trace all, but from Homer onwards and through the archaic poets, uh, and, you know, uh, and particularly the way yes. in the archaic poets, uh, eros comes in through the eyes, okay? The eyes are you know, the mirror of the soul in some way, I might say, but this is me just sets eyes on the apologists and she's a I remember, I remember a short one from that time, I didn't find it recently, uh, the one uh, that talks about eros poten rodasim. It, it, yes, okay. uh -huh. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, I'll let you a garden with roses, uh -huh. and he didn't see a bee, and this bee... Oh yes, the bee stinging. is a very nice So he ran off to Kytheria, or Kypris, as you uh -huh. mentioned, the, the two myths, uh, either from Cyprus or from Kythera, depending where we want to place Sacrifice's birthplace. And uh, running, he said, Mother, I'm dying. Uh, this uh, flying monster uh, bit me, and it's lots of pain. And then she said, if that small kendro, that small sting, sting. Uh, hurts you. Imagine how much people hurt that you hit with your uh, uh, arrows. Yes. <laughs> and this is a, a lyric from Anacreodea. Uh, Anacreodea? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. I have forgotten, I'd overlooked that one, but there you are, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. So what is the connection between the plague and arrows? What is it? Well, the point is the plague is, the EU, as I said, uh, Euripides is using uh, the plague as a metaphor uh, yeah, you know, okay. for love, because love is a form of disease. I don't have it, that's, that's why I stated it very well. I mean, uh, I don't want to get into anything personal here, but I, <laughs> I, have, felt, like <laughs> I have felt madness of Euros in my life. <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, so I have a point of clarification and then maybe a question. Um, for the clarification, you said that this play was produced somewhere around 428, four, 428 and that it was a second go yes. at this theme. Mm -hmm. So when was the first go? And if it was prior to the plague, doesn't the second go around for this play and this theme lose some of its uh, interest if it was originally written prior to the plague occurring? Yeah, that's a very good question. And the thing is that we only have you know, fragments left of the play. 99% of people believe that that play was earlier. Though a couple of scholars, as always dissenters, think it might have come later. Um, but... Um, as far as our evidence goes, that in that earlier play, this is why Euripides gets a bad reputation among comic poets at times, is that Phaedra had openly propositioned Hippolytus, whether the gods were involved in that or not. Now we know of no other tragedy where a famous playwright put on a second version. Okay. Uh, we do hear that Aristophanes 
uh, rewrote his uh, clouds because the first one had been unsuccessful. We got the revised version, but we have no evidence to put on. We never hear of anything to do with uh, the um, uh, you know, with the tragic playwrights. Now, a later commentator who's right, writing 200 years later says that because he was rankled by the, the uh, by the lack of success of the first version, he put on the second uh, version. Um, but Jasper Griffin, a famous uh, uh, classicist at Oxford, says that you know he got a lot of uh, flack from the theatre before, and he never bothered to rewrite any other version. So why should he do now? What I am suggesting in this, uh, implicitly in this, is that he needed a myth that could give him an appropriate metaphor to deal with the plague, and it was that it was the plague itself that gave him the idea, I've got to do something about, right, about this plague, okay, because it's affecting all our lives. And of course, in one sense, when he puts on this plague, the ending is in one sense optimistic, because when Artemis appears on top, it implies that the plague is over, and therefore it is a sense, you know, if the Athenians were feeling this, then, you know, it's over. And, they were, and the first two years, it was over. Unfortunately, the following year it returned. You know, so it wasn't over. But he was possibly you know, going into the sort of the idea of euphoria that there is an implicit, I think, uh, happy note of this, you know, in spite of all our suffering. <coughs> and what it, partly to this uh, lady's earlier question, I mean, how would an audience, here you've got, we don't know exactly how many in the theatre, but let me just say 10,000, it may well have been more, it might have been slightly less. But when you've got a play where the bed, in some form or another, is dominating stage property, dominating more than the human characters, and how many people, I mean, if you read Thucydides' description, I mean, attitudes to life changed. People banned in the worship of the gods. Some gave them over to a carefree life because they knew they were like, you know, uh, today might be dead tomorrow. People turned to superstitions of all sorts of things like that uh, because nobody really knew. And the doctors themselves could not help uh, find, a res uh, uh, find a solution, you know, a cure for the plague either. So I think you see here, I think he's, he's seized upon this in the bed image, making it dominant uh, to give this sort of feeling of, uh, uh, of yeah, we've suffered this terrible thing. But it's over. You know? I, I can't prove that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that is, you know, that's just a feeling I have. Yeah, but nobody, as far as I know, has taken up this idea that he's using uh, Eros as a sort of disease virus uh, you know, for the plague, as a metaphor for the plague. Yes? We are seen in the 1700s, wrote yeah. Pedro. Yes, lots of others have written Pedro. Right, but speci specifically we are seen, to what extent does he use this idea of Eros being sort of like uh, it's very different. It's a very different play, really, in that. In I mean, you've got to, you've got double loves and things like that going on. He's playing games, and he does play. Uh, he does play uh, compliment to Euripides and sort of that. But really, in the sense that modern scholarship has got hold of these things from the late nineteenth century onwards. I mean, uh, he, he's he's using imaginatively as a uh, you know, as a playwright himself, it's a sort of creative plagiarism, which I think uh, most uh, writers use. Uh, you know, Shakespeare uh, used a lot of creative plagiarism, yeah. and uh, so did Euripides, and so did Zoe. In fact, I think every time one of these playwrights wrote a play, the other one says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that, I'm going to do something different with it. You know, I think it's a, it becomes a game among them. Yes. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I would, um, I would like to ask whether the theme of Narzos appears as attached to other characters besides 
Fibra. And then also... Yes, well, it does. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, it attaches to all of them, all the main characters. And with the exception, I don't think the word Nosos itself is re referred to uh, of Theseus, but what is said of Theseus is that you are struck out of your wits and you are you're full of annoia, senselessness. So, uh, but in the others, you see, I mean, uh, the nosos, and it is said very poignantly, as I think I mentioned one uh, one place of uh, Hippolytus, that we are diseased. I mean, and he uses a plural there, which is often taken as uh, as being a poetic plural. But it could possibly refer to both uh, uh, his father uh, and himself, because you see, uh, poetic plurals are very common in tragedy for magical reasons, and sometimes you can't quite tell whether it's meant to be a poetic plural or a genuine plural. Yes, and connected to this, whether then uh, what we can say about the uh, identity of these uh, disease caused by arrows, because it seems to me that. In its contagiousness, it changes its identity. It certainly does. Well, diseases often do morph. I mean, the point is, I'm saying that the heart of, uh, as in the passage quoted from Antigone, okay, it is a form of madness. I mean, Sophocles makes the chorus sing quite specifically, and it affects everybody, gods and men. I mean, in some passages, in fragments, both of Euripides and of Aeschylus, for instance, uh, it is. Aphrodite that controls the whole workings of the universe, even Zeus, because Zeus can be subjected to her power, because we are products of sex, whether we like it or not. You know, none of us would be here without Aphrodite. I mean, I worship her. <laughs> So, I mean, it's, 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 you know, the, it is a scene, but it's, uh, this East theme is not confined to this play, by the way. Philoctetes uh, produced uh, some 20, about 20 years later. I mean, the word for disease is more rampant in that than even in uh, Hippolytus, but I mean, the uh, number of times it occurs in this play is only exceeded by that in, uh, in Philoctetes. discussion more informally over a glass of wine. Um, before we thank Professor Beer again, I'd like to remind you that those of you sitting on folding chairs, when you get up, please fold your chair and put it up against the bookshelf so that we have space. Thank you again. Thank you.